Good afternoon, everyone. This is Dr. Claire Broughton, and today I'll be discussing with you rape or sexual assault. Now, the FBI adopted a, gener a, a gender neutral definition of rape in 2012. So according to the definition, rape is the penetration, no matter how slight, of the vagina or anus with any body part or object or oral penetration by a sex organ of another person without the consent of the victim. The Uniform Crime Reports or NIBRS statistics include rape and attempted rape, but they exclude statutory rape or rape with a minor. Reports to police rarely reveal the true incidence of rape. This particular slide shows figure 11.5, 11 11-5, and it describes, it shows us sexual assault victimization by age and sex. So the uh, vertical, the horizontal parts shows the victim's age from zero to 60. And the vertical part shows the percent, percent of total sexual assault victimizations. And here you'll see that, you know, um, female constitute a huge proportion, okay, or huge, huge percent of all victims of sexual assault compared to males, although males can be victims of sexual assault. Figure 11-6 shows us the age at time of first completed rape, rape victimization among female victims. And you'll see that the highest percentage, about 37%, is between 18 to 24 years, and 30% is between 11 to 17% years. And then uh, about 25, 14% is between 25 to 4, 34 years old. What are the feminist perspectives on rape? There are multiple feminist perspectives and some have common elements. They view gender as a social construct and not a biological given. And they blame the patriarchal structures within society that contribute to the privileged status of men as the cause of rape. They often see rape as a, an act of power or domination. And they say that the sexual nature of rape is secondary to the power dynamics that occur in rapes. They also attribute blame to the rape culture, wherein there's societal conditioning or expectation that views male aggression as normal, even in sexual relations. And also the rape culture sometimes foster the belief that women should be blamed for their own rapes. For example, by wearing um, sexually provocative clothing, these are all rape myths. Another reason for, um, Another reason why rape can occur is because of the use of and um, the use and um, prevalence of pornography, which contributes to, to the objectification of women. The pathological, psychopathological perspective of rape is based on two assumptions. First, that rape is the result of an idiosyncratic mental disease. And second, rape often includes an uncontrollable sexual impulse. Growth, in fact, suggests that rape is connected to issues like power and anger. The integrated theory of rape combines elements from other theoretical explanations of rape. It explains that multiple factors combine to produce higher rates of rape at the state level. For example, support for legitimate violence, higher levels of gender inequality, and social disorganization. In fact, researchers have found support for direct effect of gender inequality on rape rates. So in societies with higher level of gender inequality, there's a, um, there's a like a rigid social structure and males are considered um, of a higher gender than females. There tends to be a higher rape rates. The evolutionary or biological perspective of rape focuses on motives and ends that are conducive to rape. So they, they believe that the feminist position of rape ignores the existence of a biologically based sexual motivation. And they say that, you know, it's the, the tendency to rape has a biological basis. And this is because of sexual selection. So the, the violent nature of males survive not because they are related to survival, because, but because they um, are necessary for males to attain their mates, okay, females, which is females, or to defend against competition over mates. So they have to, because of uh, the resource, they have to fight with other males, and this leads them to um, be violent. 
Hazelwood and Burgess developed a four-part typology that is based on offender motivation. You have the power assertive, power reassurance, anger re retaliatory, and anger excitation. Stevens' typology is based on motivations. He found that lust was a primary motive for a large pro proportion of rapists. Most rapists use just enough force to get the victim to submit. In cases involving extreme violence, the violence would have occurred regardless of the level of victim assistance and stated that advocating the idea that women should not res resist their attackers is ill-advised. Scully's typology is based on several key assumptions. He stated that rape is a socially learned behavior and rape is a reflection of a continuum of normality. And he conducted, he created a two-part typology based on patterns of rationalizations used by offenders, namely, first, the admitters, and second, the deniers. A vast majority of rapes include victims and offenders who have some prior relationships. So this is what we call acquaintance rape or date rape. It often occurs among adults in the context of the dating relationship, and this is prevalent in college campuses. Spousal rape. Until the 1970s under common law, a husband could not be prosecuted and found guilty of raping his wife because a wife is considered as property of the husband. However, 1976, um, spousal rape could already be prosecuted and it's now illegal in all states in the United States. So you can be prosecuted for spousal rape. Russell had the typology of spousal rape or would men who rape their wives. First, husbands who prefer raping their wives to having consensual sex with them. Second, husbands who enjoy both rape and, not, and consensual sex with their wives. Third, husbands who prefer consensual sex but are willing to rape, the, rape their wives. And fourth, husbands who might like to rape their wives but do not act on these desires. Rape in prison. In 2003, the Prison Rape Elimination Act was enacted or passed, which mandated the collection of rape statistics in um, correctional institutions such as prisons and jails. And they found that, you know, rape was really pre prevalent in um, correctional institutions, but victims frequently were reluctant to report incidents of rape to correctional authorities because of, first, fear of reprisal from perpetrators, they have to live in close contact with the perpetrators, so so they fear that they, you know, they if they reported, they would subject to be subject to revenge. Second, inmate code of silence. Third, personal embarrassment, especially if you're male, in the context of a, you know, in sexual assault within corrections, they feel maybe that they they're they're less male if they're victimized. And third, lack of trust in correctional staff. Research into sexual violence in prison found that most sexual aggressors do not consider themselves as homosexuals. So for them, sexual assault is an act of power and domination. The primary motivation is not, not sexual release, and many aggressors must continue participating in gang rapes to avoid, to avoid becoming victims. In fact, aggressors have suffered prior damage to their masculinity. Research has found that sexual assaults in prison are likely to have long-term psychological effects on victims. The sexual victimization of men. This issue is largely ignored until recently, and male victims are often significantly stigmatized. Traditional data sources also ignore settings where men are more likely to be sexually victimized, such as in correctional facilities. Reg regardless of this, these facts, Sexual victimization of men is common, and although it's still seen as primarily a woman's issue, and it contributes to dismissive attitudes towards male victims. So researchers emphasize the need for gender-inclusive terms for sexual victimization, objective reporting of data, and methodologies that, that account for institutionalized populations. Now let's go to child sexual abuse. It includes a variety of criminal and civil offenses in which an adult engages in sexual activity with a minor, exploits minor for purposes of sexual gratification, or exploits minor sexually for profit. The term includes a variety of activities and motivations, including child molestation, child sexual exploitation, 
and commercial sexual exploitation of children. Child sexual abuse is a crime that is greatly despised but little understood. In fact, self-reports from sex offenders and sexually abuse, abused children reveal far more abuse than officially reported. A relatively small number of offenders can commit a large number of crimes. There are several types of sexual abusers. Almost all pedophiles are male, but a few, but there are a few other similarities. They tend to be dissimilar in terms of personal characteristics, life experiences, and criminal history. And in fact, there is no single molester profile, and they arrive at this form of deviance through multiple pathways. Groff has a two-part typology of child sexual abusers. First, there is the regressed offenders, who are mainly attracted to their own age groups, but are passively aroused by minors. So they are considered regressed because the use of alcohols and, and drugs can cause them to act out of interest in having sexual encounters with children. On the other hand, fixated offenders are adult pedophiles who engaged in, in planned sexual acts with children and are not necessarily influenced by drugs or alcohol. Lanning and Dietz classify offenders along a continuum. They explain that sexual child molesters engage in sex with children when the opportunity presents, whereas preferential child molesters or pedophiles have strong proclivity or preference for sexual involvement with children. Situational child molesters are regressed, morally indiscriminate, and inadequate. On the other hand, preferred preferential child molesters or pedophiles um, engage in sed seduction or sadism. Most victims of child sexual abuse do not become child molesters. In fact, it is the child sexual victimization, in addition with other factors, such as co-occurrence of physical and vis verbal abuse, that may contribute to the child's development of um, child victim's development as child sexual abuse perpetrator as adult. So here you can see that child sexual victimization has a tendency, if accompanied by other situations, other factors, can lead that victim to be also a child sexual abuser when that person becomes an adult. Types of child sexual abuser, commercial sexual uh, exploitation of children, is any offense in which an adult victimizes a child sexually for, for profit, and it includes prostituting of a child, creating or trafficking in child pornography. Now you'll ask, is it easy or is it difficult to, uh, to prosecute and apprehend pedophiles and child pornographers? It's difficult because first of the internet, so this created special problems in enforcement of laws. And second, like the international medium, is, this is, the internet is an inter international medium and it's very hard, very difficult to police, especially when, you know, um, it, child pornographer pornography or pedophilia transcends or, or crosses state boundaries. Also, the relative anonymity of buyers and sellers using the internet makes it hard to police, to police the internet. This figure 11-7 shows us registered sex offenders by state. So please take a look at um, your state and see whether or not there's a lot of registered sex offenders in your particular area. Thank you very much for listening to my lecture on um, sexual assault. I will see you in my next class lecture on robbery and assault.